Here is how bacteria sound when they make music. Of course, this isn't about, uh, I don't know, electrobacillus teaming up with some bifidobacteria to start a band. It's an interdisciplinary art project by Ali Nikran called Sonosynthesis. And it initiates a dialogue between human nature and machine by transforming abstract data into a tangible, or rather, audible art form. And here's why this matters. You've probably all heard phrases like data is the new oil, the 21st century's raw material, or the key to the future. They do have a nice ring to them, but honestly, they're pretty fluffy. Okay, they say data is important. But what that actually means, like how data feeds into algorithms, and what impact that has, stays kinda hazy. And when it's all just a big, vague cloud, it detaches you from your own data, which then can lead to a loss of control. Like, if you don't really get what's going on, you might not care if a company scoops up data like a beekeeper harvesting honey. They might use it to train their AI systems, which can make them a stack of cash, and are ultimately trained by all of us. And that's why projects like Sonosynthesis are so crucial as they make data and its processing tangible and audible, opening up a new way to understand data truth. And that's what today's episode is all about. My name is Sarah Krisha and over the past weeks and months I've been chatting with artists, researchers and of course the creative folks at Ars Electronica to learn more about the theme of this year's festival, Who Owns the Truth? Who owns the truth? The Ur 1 Festival podcast for Ars Electronica. Episode 6. Truth in Bites. When you walk from the main square in Linz over the Nibelungen Bridge, you're standing right in front of the Ars Electronica Center, or rather the entrance to the museum. Off to the right, there is this cozy little square packed with pups and spots to grab a bite. And right in the heart of this square, there is this cool pyramid-like structure, a wide set of steps leading to a platform. Especially in summer, it's brimming with people taking a break, chatting, or just lying on their backs, staring at the sky. And there's something really symbolic about this scene. Because all these folks are actually sitting on an ascending roof beneath which future visions are being shaped. Each step is part of the Ars Electronica Future Lab, where people are continuously striving to push beyond the known and create the new at the intersection of art, science and technology. And Right there, a few steps below the folks munching, chatting and sky-gazing, I meet Ali Nikrang, an artist and researcher who's not about visualizing data, he's all about sonifying it. So my focus is about music and AI and creative AI because I have my background in music and in computer science. So I always have been interested in how can we use the formal systems to create music or to understand music actually, what makes music like it is. A popular theme in the world of AI, the imitation of the familiar doesn't particularly intrigue Alini Krang. All the artificial intelligences that promise to write texts that read just like Shakespeare or create music that sounds just like Mozart are ultimately charming illusions. Because from artistic point of view, is imitation not interesting at all? Because why should you imitate Bach? Why? Musician Nick Cave hit the nail on the head with his response. A fan had ChatGPT write song lyrics in the style of Nick Cave and was so thrilled with the result that he sent it to Cave himself. The fan wanted to know what Cave thought about the lyrics and where he, as an artist, saw the difference between this and his own lyrics. And man, did Nick Cave drop some knowledge on his blog. I put the link in the show notes as I can only read out a bit of his answer, cause it's super detailed. 
but to me he summarizes it perfectly. What ChatGPT is in this instance is replication as travesty. ChatGPT may be able to write speech in an essay or a sermon or an arbitrary, but it cannot create a genuine song. It could perhaps in time create a song that is, on the surface, indistinguishable from an original, but it will always be a replication, a kind of burlesque. Songs arise out of suffering, by which I mean they are predicated upon the complex internal human struggle of creation. And, well, as far as I know, algorithms don't feel. Data doesn't suffer. ChatGPT has no inner being. It has been nowhere. It has endured nothing. It has not had the audacity to reach beyond its limitations and hence it doesn't have the capacity for a shared transcendent experience as it has no limitations from which to transcend. ChatGPT's melancholy role is that it's destined to imitate and can never have an authentic human experience no matter how devalued and inconsequential the human experience may in time become. Here, however, we touch an aspect that greatly intrigues Aline Grang, the composer and AI researcher at Ars Electronica Future Lab. Because within the very nature of music itself and the significance a melody or a chorus can hold for someone, there is a lot that remains unexplored. I am sure and I believe that AI will lead us to completely new artistic formats. Because right now we are always thinking about music as a set of pieces that have a starting point and the ending point. But I think AI will make it possible to see music as an environment, as something that we can go through. Like we compose with AI, maybe it can be something very, very generative. So artistic works could be, you know, very special kinds of artistic environments. So on one side, AI helps to understand more about how we humans process music, and on the other, to develop new possibilities for conveying content. Which is why Ali Nikrang has developed his own AI, a music composition system. That's called Richer Car. This is an AI model that I'm using to experiment with different technical ideas, but also artistic ideas. So from a pragmatical point of view, the system should be very good in imitating music. So it means the system should be able to compose music like it was composed by humans, like classical music, that the music it is trained with. But it's just a technical goal. Artistically, it's just the starting point and can lead to many, many different various artistic concepts. And so this is something that I try to motivate people from the artistic community to be part of this development, because right now is the time to really see what the developments we have in the field of AI research and to try to formulate artistic requirements. What would you want you know, from AI to, to make an artistic work? And to be part of this development and try to create ideas that we already can create with today's AI systems, but it could also give us a direction for the future developments. The compositions with which Ali Nikrang trained his AI system date back to 1920, and he knows each and every one of them. And as such, he can understand every composition his AI creates, every association it makes, and even every unexpected nuance. For him, it's more than just an AI, it's an intuitive interface that allows for the collaborative emergence of a musical idea between humans and the AI system, just like in the Sonosynthesis project. The idea came to us as I talked to my colleague Yoko Shimizu. She is a bio artist. She used biology for artistic reasons to make art with different possibilities that she has in the biology. And the idea was, okay, if we have um, bacteria colonies, because they, they are very different to each other. So each colony, you have different growth and they look different. And what if we use these differences in the colonies to manipulate an AI system that actually is supposed to compose music? What kind of music can we get from that? We realized this project in Future Lab in Ars Electronica, 
the piece was actually something that surprises us also technically because it was not possible to play it by human pianist because you have so many very very fast arpeggios and fast running notes at the piano and also notes that are far away from each other so you can't play them with only two hands because of this we used the self-playing piano to play back those pieces and here it is Sonosynthesis offers a sensory and unusual perspective on data by translating biological processes into music. It shows us that data isn't just numbers and code, but it's all around us in nature. And it can be understood and expressed in loads of different ways. Another project being shown at the festival in September focuses on the political and social dimension of data. Unerasable characters. That's the title of the work of the artist Winnie Soon. It's a poetic and technical exploration of censored posts from Weibo, a leading social media platform in China. Specifically, they developed a special algorithm to track down posts censored by the Chinese government before they get deleted. And all these posts, the vanished voices, resurface in their work making clear that our understanding of reality and truth also strongly depends on the availability and presentation of data. For this, Unisoon was awarded this year's Golden Nika in the category of Artificial Intelligence and Life Art. Because the questions that their project raises extend beyond its specific contexts, it confronts us with the far-reaching implications of digitalization on our society, on freedom, information, and truth. And it shines a light on the role of art and cultural institutions in these processes. Artists often take an enormous personal risk when they advocate for fundamental values like freedom of speech in countries with autocratic regimes. And at the same time, cultural institutions have the power and the responsibility to amplify these voices, provide protection and support, and enable critical engagement with these issues. And that's what the next episode is all about. Values and truths. <laughs>